Welcome to our pottery series, A Home. Today we're looking at making sculptural forms. And I thought it'd be rather nice to take a look at creating something like a poppy seed head. Outside is very important to us all. And actually it is somewhere that you can find so much inspiration. So I've married together the idea that we can be inspired by the things that are outside and we can create a sculptural form, but fundamentally we're covering probably the most important aspect of ceramics, and that is if it's solid, it will explode. So to consider how to hollow a form out and make it hollow is the most important aspect of what we're doing today. That hollow form could be used for all kinds of things, but I actually think the um, inspiration that you get from nature and all of the things that you can find is a very good starting point if you want a project. So I've created these poppy seed heads um, which are really very simple to make and a perfect beginner's project. But I've been inspired myself by all of the things that you can find outside. Some of these shapes are so full of texture, so full of pattern and extraordinary forms. And I just think that nature can really inform us when we're trying to decide what it is that we want to do, or how we might colour it, or how we might pattern it. And during the process of making a poppy seed head, you will actually not just learn how to hollow clay out, but how to texture it, and finally how to colour it in exciting ways. So this is my selection of seed heads. And just to make sure that you know exactly what a seed head is, I was looking today at my fresh flowers and I spotted that one of the flowers has actually lost all of its leaves. Sometimes we think it takes so much for granted. The flowers in their own right are very beautiful, but when they lose their leaves, if you let them dry out, what they reveal is a hidden secret underneath. And that really is all about their shapes and their forms and how they function. I find flowers beautiful, but I actually find dead flowers even more exciting. So all of these, these were actually lilies from my display last year. All of these are seed heads, which contain the seeds for new life next year, but also lots of secrets as to patterns that we could employ. And if you knock them, all the seeds pop out and it's just Fabulous. So, with that thought in mind, various ceramic things have been made here. Um, completed ones are on the table and they're glazed. Most of them made by children or young adults. Um, but if you don't want to make a seed head, you can still be inspired by the form itself to make something which is rather nice. But how do you go about it? Let's begin. To begin with, you need a sizable amount of clay. I've got a piece of plaster of Paris here, it's called a plaster of Paris bat, and it's very nice for wedging clay on. Um, if you haven't got one at home, then just use a piece of wood, and you can just move your clay around and take control. We've got to start thinking about the shape here in our hands and we want it to be the form of a seed head. It's going to have a sort of bulbous base going to a pointy top and the best thing to do to begin with is to get it into your hands and to start to shape I usually twist and bang and twist and bang and twist and bang for quite a long time until I really start to own that form. All the time I'm thinking about what I'm trying to achieve. I want to have a more pointy top, so I'm banging it more towards the top. And around the bottom I want it to be a bit more bulbous, so I'm rolling it around the table and created a, round, a, rounded, a rounded base. Again, the top I want pointy, so I'm working on that there. And having done that, I can start to see the shape emerging. Another reason for hollowing the clay out is to um, reduce the weight. A piece of clay which is not hollow is actually quite a heavy piece of clay. 
What happens if you don't hollow the clay out is the very thickness of the clay um, makes it impossible, almost impossible for the sensor to dry. And because it retains moisture during the firing, if you didn't hollow it out, then that moisture would start to steam and to bubble as it heated up and it would find a way of getting out of the clay and in, in being forced out of the clay, it would probably create a small explosion or even a big explosion in your work. I mean, there are ways to control this. Bricks get fired and they're very thick and the way to control it is by firing very slowly. However, the main principle of sculpture is that your form needs to be hollow and that is what we're going to learn to do now. So when you're happy with your shape, and I think that this shape is about right now for a poppy seed head, you need to cut it in half so that you can hollow it out. Take a wire and drag it down the centre and then pull apart your two pieces. The next thing that you need to do is to mark on your piece an outside ring. We're going to take all of this clay out. To do that we need something that will scoop it out and this is a perfect tool. The clay is scooped out of the centre by pressing down and then pulling out. It's very important that you do this slowly and gradually Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to go through the clay wall into your hand. So every so often, put your piece down and feel with your fingers and feel that you haven't gone too thin in any place. A problem with clay, if it's uneven, if its thickness is thin and thick in parts, is that it will crack. So equally important as being hollow is that it's even. And I think that piece is about right. The thickness of the outside edge is the same as the thickness throughout the piece. I've done that without distorting, hopefully. So let's take a look at it. Will it go back together? Yes, pretty much the same. I did a couple of poppy seed heads and hollowed both pieces out earlier. As you can see from the original one, the clay is still very soft. And what I've got to do now is join it together. If I joined it together when it was this soft, it would become distorted. So what I did with this one is place it outside for the wind to dry it out until it had got firmer. It's not leather hard at all because I still need it to join together. Um, but it is a lot firmer. I can handle it very easy and it's not very sticky. You could do that with a hairdryer, you could waft it, but whatever you do, don't dry the edges too much. Um, you can pack the inside of the soft pieces if you're in a hurry or if you feel that that's what you want to do, uh, but don't use newspaper. What you could use is a little bit of bubble wrap. Um, the bubble wrap will burn during the firing, so we don't need to get it out. You just place it inside there and then put the other half on. The only problem with this is, of course, it is a very toxic firing with a lot of fumes. So the best thing to do, if we don't want to worry too much about ventilating our kiln, and certainly you wouldn't want to be in the room when that was firing, is to just leave it outside so that it dries in the air, or hair dryer it, or maybe even leave it overnight in a cool room. To stick it together, what we need to do first of all is to score. I think we all know by now that scoring is an essential part of joining two sides together, two edges together, two surfaces together. It's that interlocking that we get. So I'm scoring these two surfaces. and. The next thing that comes is the slurry. The slurry is a mixture of clay and water. I always have a little pot ready and um, I put a lid on and it just stays wet all the time. Sometimes I top up the water, 
but it's very important to put plenty on and to not brush it into those grooves. We don't want it in the grooves, we want it to stick up so that when we press the two halves together, no need for anything inside because I waited for these pieces to get firm. And when we put those two pieces together, it just joins nicely. I'm squeezing all those edges and watching the slurry ooze out to make sure it's all joined. So basically what I've got now is what I started with. The only difference is it's not going to explode during the firing. Actually, that's not true. It would explode during the firing if I left it like that. The other important thing to remember is if you hollow anything, or any, cavity, any cavity, then you've got to have an exit point for the air to get out. Otherwise, it'd be an even bigger explosion. So a bit later on, we'll be putting a hole into this to make sure that it doesn't explode. Please don't forget to do that. In the meanwhile, we need to join this seam together. And I find the easiest way to do that is with a coil of clay. Just put that there. Looks like a giant Easter egg. Well, not a giant Easter egg, a giant egg. Could be an Easter egg. Very, 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 very important. Those little sausages, which we call coils. Um, always used to reinforce and to join edges. And now what I'm doing is pulling one side of it to one side of the poppy seed head or the hollow form and making sure that it sticks. So that is one form which has been hollowed, stuck back together and sealed well. The next thing to do is to really work on getting the form to look neat. So if you work from the base down and curl the kidney, this is the kidney, up then it should do the job. Work your way round gently. And there I have the basis, the basic form of my poppy seed head. But of course it doesn't have to be a poppy seed head. Anything that you want to sculpt starts on the premise of a piece of clay which is hollow. Let's see how we can alter it now to make it look like the original that I produced earlier. The first thing I'm going to do is to create the kind of dimples all the way around. If you look at this, it's not a poppy seed head, but it's a seed. It's got lots of edges and parts to it that undulate all the way around. So to do that, I'm going to take a cocktail stick or a barbecue stick, place it on the top and make a cross. Having made a cross, I'm going to further divide the poppy seed head into parts. And having done that, I'm just generally going to roll that stick down. We don't need to worry about these gaps being absolutely perfect because it's supposed to be a very organic form. The next thing I'm going to do is to take a bigger stick, something with a nice corner on it. And working from the base, I'm pressing that corner in. Working from the base, I'm rolling that corner in. And then what I've got here is a little pot of water and I can run my fingers into that edge and into that edge and really start to mould that shape. It's a really lovely feeling. 
So I'm going to go around all of these now, pressing in hard. Don't press in too hard. We might just split the clay completely, but you do need to give it a bit of a persuasive push. And put your fingers in. And what's great about this is the fact that it doesn't have a hole in yet. And so therefore, the, um, the form is well supported inside and I can feel the air inside being moved around and it's helping me to keep its shape. If it didn't have that, it would probably distort. I think that's beginning to look as I want it. Of course, I could play with this for a lot longer, but I'd probably get, better get on. Okay, so there we go. That's my best side so far. What I can do now is to leave that completely plain, or if I wished, I could start to put texture in. I mean, if you look at all of these Organic forms, they've got fabulous textures in. They're really rough and ready. A little bit like the bark that we used in the first piece when we did a slab pot. Lots of lovely patterns. We could use this bark to make patterns on here. This seed head here, look at it, it's beautiful. There's lots of lines in it. So we have to find a way of translating that into the clay. We can actually take some of the pieces and press them into the clay. Look at the patterns that I can create with that. Um, we can, if we wish, use something like a brush and get the end and just put hundreds and hundreds of little holes into it. Like that. If you look at this one here, you can see that I did that earlier. But it's a good idea to work on the top. You don't need to worry too much about the sides right now um, because you're going to need to put the, the head on and you won't be able to work at the very, very top once it goes on. Now the head is this section here and you create that simply by making a ball to begin with like that. That's a little bit too big, so let's break it in half. Maybe a bit more off. Okay, so then you place your hand up like that and push your thumb into the ball as much as you can um, and pinch and pinch and do it very, very slowly. And what you're doing is actually thinning out the wall of the clay. Now you don't want hot hands when you do this. If your hands have got very hot by now, then your clay is going to begin to crack. So you need to wash them in cold water. Or if you see your clay cracking, then be careful. And if it cracks too much, you can put a little tiny bit of water on, but don't put too much on. So pinching clay is probably the first and most, most ancient method used for making pots. And all you do is make a ball and then work into it. And what will happen is it will grow and grow and grow um, and get thinner and thinner and thinner. And it's perfect for one of these seed heads or to make small vessels like these. I managed to curl that one either. So that's quite useful to know. But for this, we don't want it too thin. This is going to sit on the top. We want to make it look a little bit more exciting. So I'm going to add some coils. If I put that down on one side. The coils go inside the top, like this. All the way around. It looks very tatty to begin with. Here's some I made earlier. All the way round, like that. 
press them on. And what we're doing here is we're creating a surface that we can work into. That isn't the final product that we want. But if we now get barbecue stick, they're very useful, and press into it and divide the coil up again, then we can create this really lovely undulating pattern. Right at the edges, I like to break down the clay completely, pressing it. I think it would be nice, however, to ensure that there's also pattern not only on the inside, but on the outside where it's going to join. So to do that, what I'm going to do is to use the cotton seed head as support. Put some paper there so that it doesn't break, um, stick, sorry. And then work with your stick on that too. So you can actually get the outside and the inside of that pattern at the same time. Here's one I did earlier. It's not stuck together yet. You see the outside, you can see the inside, and there were coils on there, but I've kind of pushed them down, but the extra height in the clay gave me a little bit more texture, a little bit more volume. To stick it on, I'm going to score the top, score the bottom, put some slurry on, and push it on. Of course, if I wanted to, I could put a coil of clay around here and work that in just for a bit of extra support. I can also give these a bit of a wobble to make them look a little bit more organic. There's no reason why, instead of a coil, you couldn't actually add little balls, tiny, tiny little balls all the way round. If I take the coil off, make another one, like that, and then get my brush and push them in, like that, all the way round. So one young student has added balls underneath here and if you look very closely at a poppy seed head you can see the gallery and you can see the little windows that are underneath it um, and that's what's inspired that and as well as pushing into the clay at the side has added coils on top to give it even more structure it's the glaze that makes it though it's a really super piece we've got a tall one we've got a black one here all created on the same premise, all tiny little hollow forms, and somewhere in here, in amongst my flowers, a very small one. So lots of fun to be had being inspired by nature with hollow form. But it doesn't end there. Nature is a wonderful tool. And so you can make tools to embellish your work with by using nature for support. This tool here is called a sprig. A sprig is something that is made so that you can then create hundreds of identical pieces and particularly good for decoration. It's created by getting a block of clay like this and then taking something from nature which is firm enough, take for example this, pushing it into the clay, anything that leaves a pattern will do. That now is fired once it's dried out, of course, otherwise it would be um, exploding. And when it's fired, all you have to do is to make a ball of clay, push it into the mould, and then take a knife, put it in sideways so as not to damage it. And there we have a form which is inspired by whatever it is that you've pushed into the clay. And we can use lots of these to cover the sides of our work with. Obviously they need to be stuck on with a bit of slurry. But you can see how you can really build up a really exciting interesting surface by using sprig forms. 
and those sprigs could be anything at all that's got texture in it that you push into the clay. I'm looking at this one here and thinking how exciting that could be. So Wedgwood used um, sprigs on his work and if you take a look at Wedgwood, the blue work with the figures on top, all of those figures were made by pushing clay into a mould um, and then they were reproduced hundreds of times. I hope you've enjoyed today. We've looked at hollow form and we've looked at using nature to make moulds. See you again next time. Please subscribe to our channel. Thank you.